Terraria to me is a game all about its challenges. There is such a wide variety of items in this game that while the spark of creativity can lead to a ton of different interesting playthroughs. Many of these playthroughs, however, are starting to get a little stale. I've done all sorts of these class-based and weapon-based challenges over my time spent playing this game, and honestly, they're not that difficult anymore. Recently though, I've thought of a new idea that at first, I wasn't even sure was possible, but upon further examination, I might actually have a shot at. Me. Chester. Stats? He's got the same stats as everyone else. It's just a new character. Chester here is only allowed these loot he gains from chests. That's why I called him Chester. Let's just start the damn run. While I chop down some trees and start looking for a cave, I'd like to clarify what I mean by chest loot only. First off, I'm not just referring to weapons. I'm talking the whole shebang. Accessories, armor, hooks, anything that can be equipped or used as a weapon must be obtained from a chest. With that being said, what am I classifying as a chest for this run? These are not chests. Neither are regular mimics, and neither are crates. Uh, is this a chest? No, that's a rock. The only loot I will be using is the loot from the chest to naturally generate the star of the world. Now, I'm sure this leaves a lot of you wondering how the hell this is even possible, and I'll be covering that very shortly. But for now, I'd like to talk more about how the run's going. So far, the cave I've been exploring has been incredibly lucky. Right off the bat, I came across a gold chest, an ice chest, and four life crystals, after which I immediately discovered an underground mushroom biome. I found two more chests and life crystals before I hit a dead end and returned to the surface to start working on some houses. Although the chest loot I got was... probably some of the shitty items I could have asked for, I was still able to acquire 240 health, as well as a ton of random potions and other resources which, considering this took 5 minutes, I was very satisfied with. Back to the houses, you'll notice I'm not opting for the usual jail cells we've all come to know so well. While in some runs it can be nice to have the efficiency of the NPCs always being in the same place, I decided in this run to build actual houses just as a little mix up. These will give me the option to decorate them down the line with different furniture and blocks I find throughout the run, just so I'm not looking at the same two colors all the time. Once I was finished with the NPC houses, I held on to 50 silver to allow for the merchant to move in and began searching for another cave. When you really think about it, pre mode in this challenge is essentially just a no armor master mode run. Most of the weapons and accessories you're typically going to be using early into a run are all found in chests, and while I am missing out on a few things like Hellstone and Demonite, pre mode shouldn't really be anything outside my comfort zone. The real challenge starts as soon as I enter hard mode. In hard mode, the only new items I'll have available are from the 6 biome chests, all of which contain weapons, most of which are trash. But that's besides the point. The main problem with this is that the only mobility I'll have for the entire run is the stuff I find right now. Lucky for me, I have a pretty wide range of options to choose from. Let's start with the accessories found underground. First and most obviously, the Hermes boots. The Hermes boots literally double your movement speed on the ground and are usually an accessory you wear throughout the whole game anyways. It's no surprise that these are going to be very important. Another obvious choice are the Cloud Nabala variations. Having an extra jump is just extremely versatile. The ability to stack multiple together using different variations leads to some solid vertical mobility, especially when paired with items like the shiny red balloon or featherfall potion. The last item I really want from the underground is the web slinger. One of the most forgotten hooks in the game, and let's be honest, for good reason. Like, this shit actually sucks. The reason why it's so important in this run is because it's actually the only hook that can be found in chests. With such primitive mobility, having any sort of hook is going to be nearly indispensable later in the run, even if it is one of the worst hooks in the game. Fortunately, using a Danger Sense potion I had found from my previous mining trip, it was pretty easy to locate a spider bomb, and subsequently, a web slinger. I left the cave shortly after, and alongside the web slinger, I was walking away with a ruthless ice boomerang, four life crystals, a bunch of random resources, and two gravitation potions. Using the gravitation potions I found, I immediately began searching the sky for floating islands. After being berated by harpies for a minute straight, I eventually came across a floating island containing an unpleasant star fury. The star fury will likely be the weapon I used to kill Skeletron with, which may sound kind of strange at first. Two other weapons that immediately come to mind are the boomstick and snowball cannon, which in my opinion are much better and I have more experience using them. Believe it or not, however, these are actually not allowed. Because both of these require ammo that cannot be found in chests, I decided that using them would go against the challenge, leaving the star fury as my number one candidate for Skeletron. As I continued exploring to the left, I found a lucky horseshoe and tested out my new star fear before returning home to explore the other side of the world. Go! 
God damn, I'm ass. Over on the other side, after a good two minutes of finding completely nothing, I finally came across another sky island, this time with a red balloon. Satisfied with everything I found, I once again recalled back to base and started working on some more NPC houses. Although there isn't much to say about the lucky horseshoe, like it prevents fall damage, that's it. The shiny red balloon is another accessory that will be very significant to my overall mobility. The red balloon grants about a 75% increase in jump height, which as I briefly mentioned before, greatly complements all the bala variations I'll hopefully have in the future. Anyways, I feel like I've been explaining things for quite a while. So as I finish up these houses, I'd like to give a brief rundown of what my plans look like for the rest of free hard mode. For one, I got more mining to do. While I found some solid items so far, there's still quite a bit left to be desired. I still have room for 5 more life crystals, any sort of bala variation would be nice, and I could really go for some Hermes boots. Once I'm happy with the stuff I have, I'll fight Skeletron as soon as possible. Now, some of you may be wondering why I'm not fighting the Eye of Cthulhu or Eat of Worlds first instead. The reality is, I'm just not gaining anything by killing them. I can't use their expert mode drops, I can't craft any weapons with a demonite, and I can't do anything with a nightmare pickaxe either. Yeah, I could make some money by selling off all the drops, but I don't care. The sooner I'm able to beat Skeletron, the sooner I can get my hands on some Shadow Chest loot, and alongside that, a ton of money in the process. But that's a little down the line. After Skeletron, I'll first have to loot the dungeon, find a Shadow Key, then I'll loot some Shadow Chests, get some OP-ass weapons, and clap shit up. With the completion of two more houses, I figured I'd use some teleportation potions I found previously to hopefully explore some newer parts of my map. The first potion I used wasn't very promising, however upon using the second potion, I found myself placed deep in the underground jungle directly next to two life crystals and decided to stick around. Although the jungle is usually one of the best places to find yourself in in the early game, it's surprisingly not that great in this run. Without the boomstick, the rest of the loot found in shrine chests is pretty much useless. The main item that could be argued for is the Feral Claws, but really, I'm just not going to be using melee too much, and when I do, the Feral Claws won't be very beneficial anyways. Besides the Feral Claws, everything else is either somewhat convenient but not necessary, or a seeming hot pile of horseshit. Regardless, I ended up dying fairly quickly into exploring the jungle, and alongside the two life crystals I found right off the bat, I also left with a Warding Cloud in a bottle. An excellent find, but I still wanted to see if I could find some Hermes boots. I immediately left to go explore another cave. Once again, this cave had some nice loot, I got very lucky with a gold bag, I was able to top off my max health, and I uncovered a band of regen. Unfortunately though, still no Hermes boots. By this point, despite not having found Hermes boots yet, I was confident I could handle Skeletron with the stuff I had now. After all, you're looking at the guy who made the world-renowned Skeletron guide, how to defeat Skeletron pre-evil boss in Terraria 1.4.4 Master Mode. Basically, I know what I'm talking about. Even though I only had 4 defense, I figured the Cloud and a Bottle Red Balloon combo, Web Slinger, and Max HP would be enough for me to take down Skeletron. So I grabbed some buffs and began preparing the arena. The arena is about as standard as it gets. Two platforms spaced hook length apart with some vertical platforms on the edges to grapple onto if needed. After taking a minute to search for a potential pyramid, I returned to the dungeon, used my buffs, and summoned Skeletron. Holy shit I got cooked. Immediately after starting the fight, I was swarmed by a school of random ass enemies which constantly got in the way as I was trying to settle into the arena. Pair that with some of the worst dodging on the planet, and I was dead within a minute. Even with the fight going as bad as it did, I still knew for a fact that I could kill him with the stuff I had. When reflecting back on the fight, it was clear to me that my biggest mistake was that I had greatly underestimated the enemies that spawned before the fight. Not only did they do way more damage than I expected, but the knockback I received every time I ran into one was very disorienting. On top of this, while the Starfarer is a fairly solid boss killer, it's not very reliable against smaller targets, so I wasn't able to focus on Skeletron as much as I should have. With all that in mind, I determined that I was ready for another attempt. But first, I need to wait until the next night. Because I didn't feel like sleeping for 5 minutes, I decided I would continue my hunt for some Hermes boots and hold on to them until after I defeat Skeletron. Call me stubborn. I don't give a shit. I'm not letting this dickhead break me that easily. After about 10 minutes of searching, I once again didn't have any luck. However, I was able to walk out with 6 more life crystals, which will be useful in making heart lanterns later down the line. As the day came to a close, I made my way back over to the dungeon. With some spare time, I decided to add another platform to the arena and make this cactus house before rematching Skeletron. That's complete. <sighs> That's baloney. That's some baloney right there. Anyways, I managed to kill the Eater of Souls pretty quickly, and I was finally able to- <gasps> THAT'S COMPLETE BULLSHIT! Well, I need to figure out a plan, and I need one fast. 
If you didn't know, sandstorms provide a constant directional force against your character, causing it to speed up in the direction the wind is blowing, and slow down greatly when moving against the current. Not necessarily the ideal conditions for a boss fight, but lucky for me, I had a saving grace. The extra platform I had built right before the fight is considered to be outside the desert biome, which means when I'm up here, I'll be unaffected by the sandstorm. Obviously, it's not very practical to stay on the top platform for the whole fight, but this did enable me to form a decent strategy for how I could play around the sandstorm. Basically, I aimed to remain on the top platform for as long as I could, and try to be on the right side of the arena for when I was forced to drop down. This would allow me to move with the current, evade Skeletron, move to the top platform, and repeat the cycle. A lot easier said than done, but fortunately, I had another thing to help me out for when things went south. The Web Slinger. The Web Slinger allowed me to swiftly move against the Sandstorm when necessary, and it was the sole reason this situation didn't completely screw me over. As the hands began to get lower, the fight was finally starting to shift in my favor. The Sandstorm had stopped by then, and with the death of the first hand, I was approaching the second and by far the most easy phase of the fight. Of course though, things can never be that simple. Once I entered the second phase, I instantly recognized that there was yet another challenge to face. Time. It had taken me a while to kill the hands. With the difficulty of aiming the Star Fury and a damage nerf I was aware of but didn't quite take into account, the hand phase has taken much longer than anticipated and I now only had 3 minutes to burn through the 11,000 health of the head. I did my absolute best to prioritize damage over everything else, weaving in shots between hook uses and carefully timing Star Fury casts to maximize damage. But unfortunately, 3 minutes was simply not enough time and with only about 10% of his health left to go, the night was over. If I could get that far with the Sandstorm being present for half the night, I knew for a fact I could kill him under normal conditions. So it was back to the exact same plan as before. While I waited for the day to pass, I searched around for Hermes boots, and this time, was actually successful. With no other tasks left, I slept the rest of the day away, grabbed my buffs, and once again returned to the dungeon. I don't want to talk about it, shut the hell up. Back at it. What the hell, dude? Don't worry guys, I'm just scraping the rust off. Dude, this is your fifth attempt. All right, man. And you just spent the last three minutes explaining your master plan. Okay, I get it! On my sixth attempt at Skeletron, I was finally able to find a rhythm and reach the second phase a little over three and a half minutes left on the clock. And this time, I was not about to let the opportunity slip by. For the remainder of the fight, I made it my number one priority to do the absolute maximum damage to Skeletron. I positioned myself inches away from his spin attack to barrage him with my Ice Boomerang. I manipulated his AI to fall him with the Ice Boomerang any chance I got, and any time I felt the Ice Boomerang was no longer in its optimal range, I timed shots with the Star Fury. As you can tell, this fight heavily revolved around the Ice Boomerang, and it made me realize how much potential I had been missing out on my previous fights. With only 15 seconds left in the night, Skeletron was defeated. How that fight took 6 attempts is beyond me. Skeletron was supposed to be one of the easiest bosses in the entire run, but with how that went, it really makes me wonder how I'm going to handle some of the hard mode bosses. As of now though, things are starting to look up again. I have Hermes boots, a red balloon, and a cloud in a bottle. I have access to the dungeon, and with all the time spent waiting for days to pass, I was able to complete a lot of smaller tasks. I built jungle houses, set up planter boxes, and broke a shadow orb, enabling the possibility for a goblin army to occur. All said and done, the rest of pre-hard mode should be a breeze. Anyways, the dungeon. What am I looking for down here? Well, as much as I'd like to say there's some underrated item that'll impact the rest of the run, there just isn't. As is the case in just about every other run in existence, the main two things I'm looking for here are the Shadow Key and the Cobalt Shield. Unfortunately, almost every other item found in the dungeon can be immediately replaced by one of the Shadow Chest weapons, making them almost entirely useless in their base forms. That being said, lots of these weapons can still be quite powerful when exploring the dungeon, and after finding just about everything but what I was looking for, I came across a shadow key in about 20 minutes. I searched around a little more to see if I could find a cobalt shield as well, but upon dying for a second time, I figured I'd just get it later. As you probably guessed, the next step was getting to hell in order to loot some shadow chests. Using a shit ton of bombs, I spent some time carving out a path to hell and immediately began searching around. Although the Shadow Chest weapons are usually pretty impactful in most runs, in this run, I'll be getting real familiar with them. As I touched on before, the only upgrades available throughout the entirety of Hard Mode are the 6 Biome Chest weapons. This means that from now, all the way until I beat Plantera, I will be stuck with these same 5 weapons. 
This is where the run starts to get difficult. I have to beat the three mechanical bosses, as well as Plantera, but believe it or not, I'm not worried about Plantera in the slightest. The biggest problem I face is a mechanic unique only to the mechanical bosses in hard mode. A time limit. I will have all of 9 minutes to defeat each of the three mechanical bosses. Lucky for me, the weapons I have at my disposal complement each other very well, and when played to their strengths, are capable of getting the job done. Starting off, the first weapon I came across was the Sun Fury. While the Sun Fury can be very sluggish and awkward to use at times, it makes up for it by having the highest space damage of any weapon in pre-hard mode. Well, as long as you don't include the Bouncy Grenade, but if you're using Bouncy Grenades, like, you're an idiot. Due to the way defense is calculated, weapons with a higher base damage are actually more effective against armored targets. On top of that, the Sun Fury being melee means that it can benefit from the Sharpening Station buff, granting an additional 12 armor penetration. Together, these two attributes would in theory make the Sun Fury an excellent option for all three mechanical bosses. In practice, however, this is only somewhat true. Against Skeletron Prime, the Sun Fury should be incredible. Skeletron Prime generally stays within range of the Sun Fury, and during its spin attack, reaches a ridiculous 48 defense, which almost no other pre hard mode weapon would be able to get through. Against the Twins and the Destroyer though, the Sun Fury will not be nearly as useful. With the weird ass AI of the Twins, the only chance the Sun Fury gets at hitting them is when they dash, but even then, the Twins really don't even have that much defense to begin with, and I'd probably get more damage out of using a different weapon instead. As for the Destroyer, Man, y'all ain't stupid. There's absolutely no chance. The next weapon I came across was the Dark Lance. Like the Sun Fury, the Dark Lance's short range limits it to the Skeletron Prime fight. However, unlike the Sun Fury, it lacks the necessary base damage to hold its own against a high defense target like Skeletron Prime. To make up for this, the Dark Lance inflicts the Shadow Flame debuff. For the longest time, Shadow Flame was a debuff only available in hard mode, meaning it's actually a pretty strong debuff. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. At the end of the day, it's still a debuff, and debuffs in this game are some hot ass. Even if I could keep Shadow Flame on Skeletron Prime for the whole night, it would still only be 8,000 damage. Maybe if I was able to periodically apply Shadow Flame and swap to a different weapon afterwards, then it would be worth it. But because the Dark Lance only inflicts the debuff for 4 to 5 seconds, this just doesn't seem practical. So yeah, I'd have to get my ass kicked pretty bad to have to resort to this piece of shit. The Flower of Fire was the third weapon I uncovered. The Flower of Fire is basically just an alternative to the Sun Fury. They serve such similar purposes, so I'm just gonna have to try them both out to see which one's better in each scenario. The biggest difference between the two is that the Sun Fury can pierce and deal more damage to well armored targets, while the Flower of Fire is more versatile and has a higher DPS. If I had to guess, this likely translates to the Sun Fury being better against Skeletron Prime due to his multiple segments and high defense, and the Flower of Fire being more suited towards the Twins due to their weird movement and lower defense. Really though, I'm just gonna have to try them both out and see from there. Moving on, the fourth weapon I found was the Flame Lash. While the Flame Lash may not appear to be anything special on the surface, upon closer examination, this weapon has the potential to be extremely useful, specifically against the Twins. The main issue with the Twins I've mentioned a couple times already, is that they're just weird. They got this strange ass AI that locks both eyes in fixed positions around the player for most of the fight, which can make it very difficult to land shots. This is where the Flame Lash comes in. The Flame Lash has some of the best homing in the entire game, and because it also has one pierce, every single shot you take is almost guaranteed to hit both twins. Although this is incredible and will rack up a ton of DPS, it does have one drawback. Because I'll be dealing the same amount of damage to both twins, this also means they'll enter their second phase at the same time, which is just not a good idea to let happen. To counteract this, I'll have to single out one eye using a different weapon for at least some of the fight in order to stagger their health bars, but other than that, the Flame Lash should be the primary weapon I use for the Twins fight. Last, but certainly not least, the Hellwing Bow. This is the weapon that ties everything together. It can and probably will be used in all three fights, but its main application is against the Destroyer, and for one reason, Infinite Pierce. Now, this alone isn't anything special. Most high pierce weapons in this game have this really annoying feature where they lose a certain percent of damage for each consecutive enemy they pierce, heavily reducing their DPS against large amounts of targets. The Hellwing Bell, however, just doesn't have that. This is the real reason why the Destroyer fight is possible. Without any damage falloff, the Hellwing Bell can reach DPS counts completely unheard of in a pre hardman weapon. Despite having a base damage of only 22, with the amount of damage boosting buffs and reforges I'll have, the Helling Bow will burn straight through the Destroyer's 30 defense, and if you ignore the fact that I'll be equipped with the worst mobility items in the game and no armor, this fight should be a piece of cake. But that's all pretty far into the future. 
Until then, I still have a good amount of work to do before entering hard mode. After selling off all the extra junk I had from hell, I fought the Apcthulhu and spent some time organizing my chests, selling more useless junk in the process. The biggest thing I need before entering hard mode is money, and a lot of it. Once I enter hard mode, I will be extremely underpowered for literally the rest of the run, so in order to give myself a fighting chance, I'm gonna need the absolute best reforges possible on all my items. Reforges in this game are not cheap, and because the optimal reforge setup will vary based on the situation I'm in, I'm likely going to be swapping them around a few times. Needless to say, a couple of Ive Cthulhu summons and sold items isn't going to cover the costs. I'm going to need something bigger. Here's the plan. Rather than blow all the money I have now on reforges, I'll instead use it to build a money farm, which will then make me more money down the line. Oh, dude, you gotta slow down. What? How could you have possibly gotten there? The farm I'll be building requires me to clear out quite a bit of space underground, so once I finished up organizing, I grabbed a few buffs and made my way over to the corruption biome to fight the Eater of Worlds. I figured the Nightmare Pickaxe will be required later down the line anyways, so I may as well get one now to help out with the farm. Additionally, I'm gonna need about a platinum worth of dynamite to build this thing, so the money I get from the Eater of Worlds will come in handy. Obviously, Jake got clapped, and once I sold off all the extra loot, I found a nice spot underground built some houses nearby for easy access, and began the construction process. Believe it or not, this farm serves almost no purpose to me at this stage of the game. There just aren't many pre hard mode enemies that drop enough money to be worth farming. In hard mode, however, this farm will be incredibly beneficial to have around, and for a few reasons. First, Mimics. Despite being considered a rare creature, Mimics actually spawn quite frequently in a farm like this, and they drop a shit ton of money. All it'll take is a few hours of AFKing, and I'll basically never have to worry about money again. This farm will also be a super easy way to get souls. Realistically, I'm probably not going to be first trying the three mech bosses, so it'll be nice to not have to go back to some ghetto-ass water candle setup for 15 minutes every time I need another summon. Lastly, and arguably most importantly, biome keys. Without a farm like this, it can take literal hours to get a single biome key to drop, and because I'll likely want more than one, this farm is pretty much required. And as for why I'm building the farm in pre-hard mode, it's simply easier to work on without having to deal with hard mode enemies. Anyways, after about 30 minutes, the majority of the farm was complete. To give a brief summary as to how it works, enemies in this game can only spawn between 62 and 84 tiles horizontally from the player, and 35 to 47 tiles vertically. By removing every block around me within these boundaries, enemies are only able to spawn where I let them. In this case, the bridge I made. All I have to do from here is add some dart traps in order to aggravate mimics, fill the volcano trap in the middle with lava, and boom, I'll have a farm that can obtain pretty much any item dropped by enemies with ease. Upon returning to the surface, I collected a few fallen stars, and made my way over to the house to acquire the tools I need to finish up the farm, but just as I was about to do so, a goblin army. This was a very pleasant surprise. Although the goblin army is only a 1 in 3 chance each day, there have been too many times where I spent multiple days waiting for a goblin army to occur in pre-hard mode, and just never got one. But that's besides the point. I lucked out and got one early, and with that out of the way, there's only a few tasks left for me to do. First off, I wanted to finish up what I was working on before. With the buckets I crafted previously, I teleported underground, picked up the goblin tinker, and started moving towards hell in order to grab some lava. While I was at it, I found a pretty cool spot for some cavern houses, so I spent a few minutes building those before returning to my original plan. I filled up the farm with lava, did some reforging, bought some wiring from the mechanic, and set up the two dart traps, officially completing the farm. The next task at hand was searching for a couple more accessories I'd like to find prior to entering hard mode. I teleported to my desert pylon and entered the dungeon to look for the first of these accessories, the cobalt shield. This shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. The cobalt shield and its variations are already some of the best accessories in the game, and although I don't have access to any of its upgrades, the cobalt shield will still be very useful to have in this run. With the Shadow Chest weapons, exploring the dungeon was no problem, and after about 5 minutes, I found what I was looking for. I reforged it to Warding, and immediately went off to search for the second accessory, the Blizzard in a Bottle. Once again, this should come as no surprise. Mobility is by far going to be one of the biggest obstacles in this run, so the more bottle variations I find, the better. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that a pyramid has generated my world, meaning the Sandstorm in a Bottle is out of the question. But no worries, the Blizzard in a Bottle will be more than enough. Hey, at least I'll have two bottle variations. I mean, no one wants to be the eye with just a cloud in a bottle. <laughs> Man, that would suck. Yeah, I wasn't able to find a blizzard in a bottle, and that's a problem. The mobility I have now is... Shit. 
to say the absolute least. And I have no idea how I'm gonna take on hard mode like this. But you know what? With a Featherfall Potion in a well-structured arena, I don't think it's impossible. I know for a fact I at least have enough to kill the Wall of Flesh, so let's just see how far I can take it from there. With nothing left to do in pre-hard mode, I grabbed some stone, killed yet another goblin army, reforged a few accessories, and descended into hell to start preparing for the Wall of Flesh fight. The Wall of Flesh should not be nearly as hard as Skeletron was. Against Skeletron, I was forced to use some very underpowered weapons. For the Wall of Flesh, however, I have access to the Hellwing Bow, which is unironically the best weapon I could possibly have for this fight. On top of that, even with my mobility being trash, at least I have Hermes Boots this time around, and despite having no armor, my defense is still pretty solid. Anyways, the prep for the Wall of Flesh fight didn't consist of much. Really, I just cleared out some obsidian structures and built a few bridges over places I thought I might get caught on. It's not the smoothest of runways, but it'll get the job done. In about 20 minutes, I had reached the edge of the world, and just like that, I was ready for the fight. I already had all my buffs sorted out, so I used the potion of return to despawn all the enemies in hell, and teleported back to the end of the platform to summon the Wall of Flesh. It always feels weird getting ready for the Wall of Flesh. It feels like there's more to be done, but there just isn't. Regardless, the start of the fight was going very well. The Featherfall Potion was very helpful with dodging on the lasers, and I was doing an excellent job avoiding taking damage. I mean, come to think of it, like, I'm making it look easy. Like, I'm kind of bossed up right now. Is she gonna follow me? She like the way I live? Yeah, this fight was a disaster. Despite me being at full health with a health potion off cooldown three quarters into the fight, the Wall of Flesh was starting to scale up in difficulty extremely fast, and I was caught off guard. I was standing way too close to the Wall of Flesh at this point, and because my runway was so jagged, I kept bumping into shit and killing all my momentum. Usually, I can get away with a half-assed runway like this in a regular run, as with the Shield of Cthulhu or any hook besides the Web Slinger, it's very easy to remain at full speed. In this run, however, I was having a hard time getting around all the different obstacles with just a cloud in a bottle, and as a result, I got clapped. Overall, the main thing to conclude from this first attempt was that the runway did not get the job done. I honestly did feel pretty comfortable dodging with the mobility I had, it's just once I reached the later half of the fight, I simply couldn't remain far enough away from the wall of flesh to avoid getting hit by, you know, every single laser he fired. A flatter runway would allow me to keep a good distance between me and the boss, making the barrage of lasers at the end of the fight a lot more manageable. So, upon respawning, I made some minor adjustments to my reforges, and purchased some dynamite to begin renovating the bridge. Thankfully, leveling out the runway is a pretty easy fix. If I hadn't been comfortable with my mobility or damage during the fight, it'd be a lot more difficult to find a solution to those problems as opposed to just buying some dynamite and blowing shit up. After a little while of leveling out uneven terrain and filling in gaps with stone, I was ready for my second attempt. I used another potion of return, grabbed any and every buff I felt could come in handy, and teleported back to hell to once again summon the Wall of Flesh. The beginning of this fight is total cake. I can't stress enough how helpful it is to have the Hellwing Bow against the Wall of Flesh. The infinite pierce means I don't have to pay a single bit of attention to the hungries, and because the wall of flesh has some fairly low defense, the Hellwing Bow's fast fire rate completely melts it. Hell, I don't even have to have the wall of flesh on screen, I can just blindly aim in its direction and still do a crazy amount of damage. As the fight progresses, however, things start to get a lot more challenging, even with the Hellwing Bow. Throughout the entire fight, the wall of flesh scales up in speed, fire rate, and damage as it reaches different health thresholds, though it's only around the 25% health mark where this actually starts to matter. By this point, the lasers become very difficult to weave in between, but by moving above and below them, I was still remaining pretty close to full health. Having as much health as possible is critical this late into the fight, because, as you can see, once you hit the 10% health mark, there's only so much you can do to avoid taking damage. Even worse, I just ran out of room, so with no other options, I dove at the bottom eye to deal as much damage as possible, and to my luck, barely edged out the victory. Finally, I made it to hard mode, but as we all know, that was never the concern to begin with. The stuff I have now is more than enough to get me past the wall of flesh, but from here on out, the only upgrades available are the six biome chest weapons. Basically, I need to make it past Plantera, and this is my loadout. <laughs> Needless to say, I got some work to do. I started by completing a few tasks that come naturally with the transition to hard mode. The corruption biome literally generated in the worst place possible, so the first thing I did was address some of the issues it caused. I blew a hole in the ground on the surface to prevent the corruption from spreading into my base, and moved the citizens of my mushroom village to a new and improved spot above the money farm. 
In the process, I stumbled across two mimics, granting me about a platinum worth of coins. All of which I spent on a balloon in an attempt to get warding. Next, I needed some more housing. I went over to the hollowed biome and built this weird snowman setup. It looks like shit right now, but I may decide to expand upon it in the future. After that, I kinda just played around with the money farm for a bit. So much of my effort in this run had been spent getting past the wall of flesh, that by the time I entered hard mode, I didn't really have a plan laid out. I knew I would need a lot of money no matter what though, so I drank a battle potion and I had this little fishing hole in the meantime. Once the battle potion had worn off, I was again left with about a platinum worth of coins. This should be more than enough to cover most of my reforging costs while I figure out a plan for early hard mode. Oh, never mind, I spent it all on the balloon again. Before I did anything else in this world, I took some time to think of the steps I should be taking prior to fighting the mech bosses. First, I needed more money. And this time, instead of blowing it all on reforges right away, I'm gonna hold on to it for a bit. So far, I've kinda just been instinctively going for warding on all my accessories, but one thing I forgot to consider is that because I have a time limit during the mech bosses, I may need my accessories to consist of lucky and menacing reforges instead. I'll have to do some testing to find out which is optimal, so until that point, I'll be holding on to everything I make. Getting the amount of money I'm looking for is gonna take a lot of AFK time in the farm, so to start, I visited the underworld. Can't believe I'm about to say this, but I need a treasure magnet. The increased pickup range from the treasure magnet will allow me to collect all the items dropped by the farm without needing to move. It's not completely necessary, as items in this game really don't despawn very often, but it couldn't hurt to look for a moment. Unfortunately, I didn't end up finding a treasure magnet, so I just went to the farm without it. I turned on the dart traps, popped a battle potion, and went to go watch a movie. After almost two hours of AFKing, I was left with five platinum worth of coins and a ton of random drops. Yeah, I wasn't kidding when I said items don't really despawn. Upon selling all the dropped items, I now had a total of eight platinum in the bank. The next thing I decided to spend my time on was an artificial fishing pond. Obviously, with how much I've been hyping up the mech bosses, I'm gonna need some crazy buffs. Almost all the best buffs in this game come from fishing, so I set up a little fishing area below the money farm. Being right by the money farm will allow me to swap out the biome with relative ease, as well as allow me to farm souls while I fish. Unfortunately, fishing's boring as shit. So once I set up the pond, I returned back to base to start working on my next project, a chest room. I figured it was about time I upgraded for my shitty little 5 chest setup. Because the design I wanted to make was entirely underground, I decided now would also be a good time to upgrade my pickaxe to Aura Calcum to make the job a little easier. After a couple minutes of mining, I got started. As I finish up the chest room, I want to talk a little more about the mech bosses. While I do think I did a pretty good job detailing my thoughts about them during my descriptions of the shadow chest weapons, I still hadn't done the actual testing at the time. Between my past few play sessions though, I have ran some realistic attempts at each of the three mech bosses, and I've decided the first boss I want to fight is the Destroyer. This shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. Even without testing, it was pretty obvious that Helming Bow would make a good match for the Destroyer, and this is the boss I believe I have the best chance at killing first. Now, just because I'm saying all this does not mean this fight is easy. Yes, the damage is there to kill the Destroyer, but the actual strategy deviates quite a bit from just spraying arrows until he dies. Genuinely, this fight is super difficult, and there's a lot of luck involved, but I'll save all that for when I'm in the battle. Until then, why does it even matter what boss I fight first if I don't get any upgrades until after I kill Plantera? Well, although I won't be getting any new weapons or accessories before killing Plantera, there's still quite a bit to gain from killing the first mech boss. The most obvious thing that I think most of you are aware of is that the Steampunker will move in, granting me the ability to craft Asphalt. Now in my opinion, I think Asphalt would be a little overpowered in this run, so I'd like to avoid using it as much as possible. Still, I wanted to mention it as a last resort option. The main thing I gain out of killing the first mech boss is Life Fruit. Believe it or not, Life Fruit begins to generate after just one mech boss, not all three. This is something I was completely unaware of until recently, but nonetheless, having an extra 100 health and 4 defense for Skeletron Prime and the Twins will hopefully make the fights a lot more manageable. It's gonna be a little while till I'm at that point, however. For now, I need to focus on preparing for the Destroyer. With the chest room finally complete, it was time to start working on an arena. Generally, I like to build my main arena right above spawn, so after spamming some sunflowers on the right side of my base to hold off the corruption, I got to work on building the platforms. Once the platforms were all set up, I made my way underground to make the Goblin Tinker and Mechanic their own designated homes. I knew I had lots of reforging to do before the Destroyer, but I need to wait until nighttime for the Tinker and Mechanic to teleport to the new houses. In the meantime, I teleported over to the jungle to do some exploring. 
As I said previously, the items found in the jungle chest really aren't that helpful in this run, but there are two items in specific that couldn't hurt to have. The first of these that I came across pretty quickly is the Anklet of the Wind. The Anklet of the Wind increases movement speed by 10%, which is pretty ass, but it's better than the climbing claws I have on currently. A couple minutes later, I found the second of these items, the Staff of Regrowth. The Staff of Regrowth will allow me to collect herbs for potions a lot more efficiently, and with the amount of potions I'll be crafting for the rest of the run, I figured the sooner I found one, the better. Upon returning home, I reforged my Helming Bow to Unreal and collected some Wormies around the world. From here on out, the grinding starts to become pretty mindless. There was just a lot of boring ass shit I had to do before I could be ready to begin attempts at the Destroyer, so instead of running through each individual step of the way, I'll do my best to summarize it for you all. Firstly, I fished. There were five buffs I needed from fishing. Endurance, Wrath, Rage, Heartreach, and Life Force. I don't think I really need to explain any of these, but I do want to take note of the Wrath and Rage potions, as the extra 10% damage and crit chance I gain from these will be very helpful in getting past the 9 minute time limit of the mech bosses. Back at the base, I touched up on the arena a bit, after which I searched for some bass statues, started to gather buffs, and reforged all my accessories to either lucky or menacing. Because of the time limit, I'm gonna need to go all out on damage, so although it sucks to miss out on a potential 28 defense from all warding accessories, the extra 28% damage will not go to waste. Once I was done with that, I killed myself a bunch, set up a graveyard by the dry in order to buy crimson seeds, fished more, set up windows, gathered jungle spores, crafted a void bag, harvested deathweed, built some more houses, farmed pixies, set up another platform. What the fuck? Just like that, the destroyer prep was done. To give a quick recap as to what I've gathered, I now have four large platforms spanning over my base, with heart lanterns, campfires, and two bass statues spaced appropriately. Fully optimized reforges for maximum damage, 18 different buffs, two station buffs, and the same shitty ass accessories I got within the first hour of the run. The only thing left to do from here was to wait out the rest of the day. I went to sleep, and once night hit, I was ready for the first attempt. Alright, so what you want to do here is you kind of want to- Yeah, this fight is not going to be easy. Now, I had practiced the destroyer fight on a separate world, so I know how to beat him, but there was just a lot that went wrong in this first attempt. Immediately, I lured the destroyer very high off the ground, making it a lot harder to dodge the lasers from his body. I'll get more into this later, as manipulating where the destroyer moves to is probably the most essential part of this fight, but for now, just know that when he's high up in the air like this, it ain't gonna be pretty. The next mistake I made was dealing too much damage at the start. If you didn't know, each of the Destroyer's body segments can spawn a probe when damaged. Afterwards, the segment fizzles out, and it can't spawn any more probes. From what I've found in my practice, the Destroyer spawns way more probes in the first, maybe 15% of his health. Beyond that, the probes become a lot less frequent. When I attacked him at the start of the fight, I only damaged about a 20th of his health, yet 7 probes were able to spawn, which completely overwhelmed me. Now, there's a lot to say about these probes, but to keep the attempts moving, I'm gonna save that for later. Overall, after these two mistakes, I had completely panicked, and the fight was over in 25 seconds. Still, I knew I was capable of winning this battle, so the only thing left to do from here is to keep grinding on attempts until I did. On attempt 2, I had a much better start. The Destroyer was in a great position for the first laser barrage, and I made it past the early swarm of probes as well. As you can see, the flame last year was a huge help. It's incredible homie allows me to just spam shots in the direction of the probes while keeping my full attention on dodging. Don't get me wrong, the damage here could be a little better, but hey, that's what the 20 different buffs are for. This fight continued to go on for quite a while. I made it to the halfway point with full health and a health potion off cooldown. This was starting to look like it could be the run. But of course, that's way too good to be true. Shortly after hitting the 50% mark, I'd let the Destroyer's movement get way out of hand, and after a series of hits, the fight had taken a complete 180. This fight is absolutely ruthless. Even the slightest loss of focus can lead to situations like this in a heartbeat. I held on for as long as I could, but it was only a matter of time before I died. Still, reaching 25% health on attempt 2 was fantastic, so I went right back to farming out more resources for the next attempts. Okay, well if I get another attempt after this, there is no chance I'm doing it on a new moon. Look at this, there's so much shit everywhere! I do still have a chance though. If I can maintain enough health and get back to another health potion, I can handle the extra enemy spot- Okay, well that about wraps up this attempt. This run is going way smoother. 
Once again, my health is in a great spot, and I can see this becoming another attempt. God damn it! Oh, this guy's about to be such an asshole. Dude, despawn already. I hear you up there. Dickhead, get out of the way! Welp, here we are. Attempt 6. For the start of the fight, I was very cautious not to deal too much damage. It is so easy to let the probes get out of hand early on, so for the first couple minutes of the fight, you can see I willingly gave up huge damage opportunities in favor of clearing out the probes. Now, this may seem like a dumb idea, considering my damage isn't great and I only have 9 minutes to kill the destroyer, but the reality is, this fight revolves around the probes, and there's two main reasons why. Obviously, these guys do a ton of damage. I think there's enough evidence to support that by now. But also, each probe has a 50% chance to drop a heart. This means that by managing them wisely, you know, spawning maybe 5 probes at a time, I can actually gain health off them. In the beginning of the fight, this is pretty tricky to balance, but as the fight progresses, probes become a lot less common, which encourages me to go a lot crazier on the destroyer as they'll come to see. Enough talk about the probes though. By now, I was well past the early probe threshold, and it's time to shift my attention towards the destroyer. Another huge focus of this fight is guiding the destroyer. It's no secret that my movement in this run is ass. I have a web slinger, cloud in a bottle, and Hermes boots, and the featherfall potion is quite literally the only thing keeping me alive. Side note, shout out to the dude in the comments who told me holding up with the featherfall potion increases mobility. That is actually so helpful. But anyways, because my movement is so ass, the only way to keep my distance from the destroyer is by cleverly guiding him where I want. The best way I find to go about doing this is by leading him in one direction and waiting for him to lunge at you. Once he takes the bait, you quickly turn around with the web slinger. If you don't wait for him to lunge, the destroyer will end up being right beside you, or even worse, above you, making it way harder to avoid the laser barrage. Obviously, shitty destroyer movement is bound to happen sometimes, in fact, it's been present a ton in this run, but all I can do is try to minimize it. Other than that, there's not too much I got left to say about this fight. All I can do from here is continue putting my web slinger to good use, evade as many lasers as possible, and keep it together for the home stretch. Finally, the destroyer was dead, and it actually didn't take as long as I thought it would. But of course, there's only so much celebrating that can be done. I still have two more mech bosses left, so immediately after killing the destroyer, I got to work on preparing for the next mech boss, Skeletron Prime. Some of you may be wondering, why am I fighting Skeletron Prime second? Well, the twins are hard as shit, so they're last, but I was more referring to my first fight with the destroyer. If you're anything like me, Skeletron Prime is almost always the easiest mechanical boss, and you'd think I'd want to fight him first. But there's one big flaw with this idea. Speed. Now, I don't mean to toot my own horn or anything, but I think I've gotten pretty damn good with the movement I have. The only problem is, the movement I have is dog shit, and my speed is capped extremely low. This is why I decided to fight the Destroyer first. Using my luring technique, the Destroyer can be easily steered off course, and because he's always moving in a fixed path, it's really not hard to find some breathing room in the fight. Against Skeletron Prime, however, as soon as he starts spinning, I can't create any space between us, and I'm almost guaranteed to take a ton of damage. I do have access to Life Root now, but let's be honest, it's not like I'm gonna be able to tank every single spin phase. I need a way to move faster, and I know everyone is thinking of Asphalt here, but I don't want to use that. Running over 80 miles per hour against mech bosses is super overpowered. But what if there's a way to run maybe half that? What if this was in the form of an item that could be obtained from chess? What if I already had that item? Yup, the Dune Rider boots. The Dune Rider boots allow you to run up to 54 miles per hour on sand blocks. From what I've found, this is the perfect boost to allow me to keep my distance from the spin attack, but not completely smoke the boss like with asphalt. So I grabbed some sand and began modifying the bottom layer of my arena. With the arena complete, the only thing left for me to do was... Wait. A bit anticlimactic, but yeah. Before Skeletron Prime, I need a total of 21 life fruit, and because I'm on a small sized world, that's gonna take a little while to grow. 
In the meantime, instead of just sitting in a bed for two hours, I figured I may as well put the time to good use and farm for some biome keys. Although I won't be able to use the biome keys until after Plantera, I'm gonna need to get them eventually, so I may as well do it now while I have the time. In case you didn't know, there are a total of six different biome keys in the game, each corresponding to a different weapon found in the dungeon. The keys have a 1 in 2500 chance to drop from any enemy in their respective biomes, and because I'm in a corruption world, the crimson chest is unobtainable, leaving me with five different weapons I can go for. As of now, I'd like to go for all five, but, you know, it's a 1 in 2500 chance, so I might not be feeling the same way after four hours of AFKing. Whatever the case, there are a select few I definitely want, so after grabbing some blocks, I made my way down to the enemy farm to set up some artificial biomes. The first key I'm going for is the Corruption Key, which will grant me the Scourge of the Corruptor. The Scourge of the Corruptor is one of the most unique melee weapons in the whole game. It fires these fast-moving javelins that upon contact with a wall or enemy, split into a bunch of homing tiny eaters. The Scourge of the Corruptor is one of the only bomb chest weapons that can actually deal a significant amount of damage on its own, making it an absolute must-have for this run. The other key I want to try and get is the Desert Key, which grants me the Desert Tiger Staff. The Tiger Staff is another very unique weapon, being that each summit upgrades a single tiger rather than spawning more. This is another weapon I really want, but it's not necessarily an essential. You see, most of the biome chest weapons are mostly just support and can't really hold their own as a standalone weapon. At least for the type of shit I have. I can see the tiger adding a solid amount of DPS, especially with the Bewishing Table and Summoning Potion, but I'd be lying if I said I thought it was as important as the Scourge of the Corruptor. Luckily, the Corruption Biome and Desert are not mutually exclusive, so there's no downside to attempting to farm both at the same time. Well, besides the fact that I have to place 1500 sand blocks by hand. With both biomes in place, it was time to start AFKing. I placed a Shadow Candle, grabbed a Battle Potion, and left my game alone for a bit to see if anything would go wrong. Aw oh man, World Feeder. That sucks. I came back, got rid of the Corruption Biome, and placed down some walls to see if that would fix the problem. There we go. That should do the trick. Yeah, I have no idea why this keeps happening. Now, I'm not dumb. It's pretty obvious the worms are getting caught in the sand blocks and are able to leap back at me. But getting the worms to spawn in the first place is a problem I've literally never been faced with. Even in my previous AFK session, throughout the whole two hours, there was not a single digger that had spawned. If I had to guess, maybe there was a certain block count that has to be on screen in order for worms to spawn, but I genuinely just don't know. Whatever the case, I really wanted to keep the desert around, as having a chance to get both the corruption key and desert key would be very efficient. I thought maybe lowering the lava floor could fix the problem, but of course, it didn't do anything. Also, I am so damn glad I built this farm in pre-hard mode, like this was actually hell to do. Anyways, yeah screw this shit, I'll just stick to corruption. I adjusted the corruption bottom to make it even on both sides, and as expected, the worms were no longer a problem. With that, I used a battle potion, and it was finally time for me to start AFKing. As always, I checked back into the farm a few times within the first hour of AFKing, and everything seemed to be going well. Unfortunately, I still had no luck on getting the corruption key, so I decided to just let the farm do its thing for a little while, and I'll check back in about an hour. I mean, there was no trouble whatsoever within the first hour here, so there really shouldn't be any issues from here on out. <laughs> Five minutes after I left the farm alone, Tom the Skeleton Merchant spawns in, hits a Corruption Mimic, to which the Corruption Mimic aggros to me, kills me, and I proceed to die to some random pirate invasion for 45 minutes straight. Once again, this has literally never happened to me any other time I made this farm. Luckily, this is a pretty uncommon scenario, so I should just be able to continue AF Kang, and if it happens again, whatever. It's not that big of a deal, but I highly doubt something that rare will occur again. Anyways, after respawning, I returned back to the farm to continue the hunt for the corruption key. I left the farm alone for about an hour yet again, and of course, the same shit happened to me. Thankfully, this was towards the end of the session, so it didn't affect me that much, but at the time, I had no idea how long this had been going on for. To my surprise though, when I went back underground to collect the loot I missed, there was actually a corruption key. After placing the corruption key in a safe spot, I burned through the annoying pirate invasion that's been sitting on the surface for two hours, and went to the jungle to start looking for life fruit. I figured a good amount of life fruit had probably grown by now, so I wanted to see how many I could find. I took a little detour to reforge my flower fire and farm some more health potions, but once all that was complete, I was back to the jungle. Overall, I ended up walking away with 11 life fruit, which was pretty good, but I still needed 10 more. 
There really is nothing better to do than just AFK the farm again, so I started preparing to farm for the next key I definitely wanted, the jungle key. In order to farm for the jungle key, I placed a dry in the mushroom biome, bought some mushroom seeds from her, and searched for my world's aether biome to transmute the mushroom seeds into jungle seeds. From there, I went to the farm, built an artificial jungle biome, and immediately began AFKing. Nice. Stupid ass worm. After about two hours of AFKing, the jungle key had dropped, and as I clear up this goblin army, I'd like to explain why I decided to go for the jungle key next. The jungle key grants me the piranha gun, which besides the scourge of the corruptor, is the only other biome chest weapon that can deal a solid amount of DPS by itself. These weapons are different enough to where I'm not exactly sure which one will perform better in what scenarios, so I just went for both. Might not be the most optimal plays, as it really wouldn't be that hard to test, but at the end of the day, all the bomb chest weapons are cool as shit, so the more I have, the more fun this run will be. Anyways, now that I've spent an additional 2 hours AFKing, finding 10 more life fruit shouldn't be a problem. So I grabbed some buffs and headed to the jungle. As predicted, I was able to find the 10 life fruit I needed, and with that finally out of the way, there were just a few things left to do before I could fight Skeletron Prime. First off, I need to get some permanent aether buffs. Taking along a life fruit, mana crystal, life crystal, and apricot, I visited the aether in order to convert each consumable into an aegis fruit, arcane crystal, vital crystal, and ambrosia respectively. The next thing I wanted to do before Skeletron was expand my arena. Now that the bottom platform is made up of sand, the faster running speed means I'm going to want a larger runway in order to avoid hitting the edges of the arena during a boss fight. So, after purifying some of the corruption and hollow surrounding my base, I bought some dynamite and cleared out a large space to the right of my arena. With the extra room, I expanded all four platforms of the arena, lit them up with torches, and placed down some campfires, heart lanterns, and peace candles as needed. Just like that, the arena was complete, and there was only one thing left to do. I teleported to the hollow, did some fishing cause why not, and talked to the party girl in order to buy a shit ton of pigranadas. You see, despite having 18 different buffs to the destroyer fight, there was still one thing I was missing. Exquisitely stuffed. In most cases, this could actually be a pretty difficult buff to obtain in bulk, which is why for the destroyer I instead opted for Plenty Satisfied. With Pigranadas, however, each Pigranada has a 2.5% chance of dropping bacon, and by using a spike ball and holding down the place button, getting a large amount of the exquisitely stuffed buff is extremely easy. Well, as long as you have 6 platinum to spare. Anyways, after obtaining 28 pieces of bacon from the Pigranadas I bought, I was now officially ready for the Skeletron Prime fight. And despite having some of the shittiest equipment this game has to offer, I am so goddamn stacked. Along with everything I have for the Destroyer, I now also have, exquisitely stuffed, three permanent Aether buffs, mythical, godly, and unreal on all my weapons, and most importantly, max health. So once I grabbed all the buffs I needed, I slept until night and summoned Skeletron Prime. As I'm sure you all know, the Skeletron Prime fight can be separated into two distinct phases, the normal phase and the spinning phase. During the normal phase, there are basically no threats whatsoever. None of his attacks are hard to avoid, and it's kind of just an opportunity to build up damage. The spin phase, however, is a different story. While spinning, Skeletron's speed, damage, and defense are all increased greatly, and making one wrong move will either drain half your health, or just flat out kill you instantly. Needless to say, this is where most of my strategy stems from. Starting with the sand platform, this allows me to just barely outrun Skeletron during his spin phase. Now, it's not perfect, as the laser and melee arms are still capable of hitting me at times, but definitely helps alleviate a lot of the pressure. Outside of the spin phase though, the sand platform isn't quite as helpful, as taking advantage of the full arena makes dodging and dealing damage in the normal phase a lot easier. The next thing I want to talk about is the weapons. Beginning with the flower fire, this is my main damage dealer for the fight. Its high base damage combined with its fast fire rate makes it an excellent choice against Skeletron Prime. However, its short range and slow projectile speed limits it mostly to the spin phase where Skeletron Prime moves in a straight line. Now, I know I compared this weapon a lot to the Sun Fury a while back, and I really did think the Sun Fury would be better, but obviously, that was not the case. The problem with the Sun Fury is that it's just way too slow. Every time you fire it, it takes forever to come back, and overall, it's just awkward as hell to use. The other weapon I have for this fight is the Hellwing Bow. The Hellwing Bow quite literally just serves to fill in the gaps of when I'm not using the Flower of Fire. I'm low on mana, Hellwing Bow. Skeletron's out of range, Hellwing Bow. With Hellfire Arrows, the Hellwing Bow can actually deal a pretty solid amount of damage to Skeletron Prime, and despite its horrendous accuracy, it surprisingly can still hold its own at further ranges. So, with all that out of the way, the rest of this fight is pretty simple. 
In the normal phase, I make use of the arena's platforms and mostly use the Helming Bow for its extra range. Once Galtron enters the spin phase, I drop down to the sand platform and use the Flower of Fire as much as possible to get past the higher defense in this phase. All that's left to do now is repeat the cycle another 20 times and hopefully kill Skulltron Prime. After about 7.5 minutes of fighting, Skeletron Prime was finally dead. Alright, time to address the elephant in the room here. That wasn't hard. Now, I'm not saying every fight needs to be hard, like, some bosses are just easy, but I think we can all agree that the sand platform was pretty overpowered in this fight. Outside of the occasional laser, I'd basically never get hit during the spin phase, and honestly, the fight wasn't as interesting as it could have been. With how dominant that fight was, I feel like it definitely could have been possible without the sand platform, I just didn't give myself enough of a chance when I was initially testing. Whatever the case, I learned my lesson, and I was not about to rely on some overpowered cheese to get me through the rest of the run. The last mech boss I need to defeat is the twins, and I can confidently say that this shit is not going to be easy. I already struggled to kill the twins with normal gear, and going into this challenge, I genuinely thought these guys might be impossible without any external help like asphalt. To my surprise though, after some recent testing I did, this fight is possible. No sand platform, no weird arena techniques, no cheese, the twins are possible. So I got right to work on preparing. Because of the sheer amount of work I did for Skeletron Prime, there's actually no further upgrades available to me at this point. As far as I know, killing two mech bosses doesn't unlock anything new like how killing one mech boss does, so the only thing I need to do before the twins is stock up on buffs. After collecting a bunch of low level bait from the jungle, I made an artificial crimson biome and spent some time fishing at the farm. Fortunately, having access to the staff of regrowth has made getting the herbs required for buffs super easy, so all I really needed to focus on was getting the 5 fish from earlier. I had already done some fishing in the hollow previously, so once I was satisfied in the crimson biome, I did some more fishing in the corruption before heading back to base and crafting on my buffs. From here, I spent about 5 minutes removing the sand platform from the arena, and just like that, there was officially nothing left for me to do that could aid me in the twins fight. All I can do now is just grind out attempts until I beat him, so without further ado, let's get started. Right away, you can see I'm using the same weapons as I did for the Skeletron Prime fight. This combo of the Hellwing Bow and Flower of Fire did a pretty awesome job dealing with Skeletron Prime, and it's no different in this fight. With the extra velocity of the Hellfire arrows, I'm able to land the majority of my shots with the Hellwing Bow, and because the twins also have some really low defense, the Hellwing Bow is genuinely a decent weapon in this fight. The Flower of Fire, on the other hand, is a little more limited in when it can be used, but deals even more damage than the Hellwing Bow and can absolutely shred the twins in the right situations. Now, I can't talk about the weapons I'm using without at least mentioning the Flame Lash. This was a weapon I initially predicted to be really good in the Twins fight, mostly due to its incredible homing ability. However, in practice, it's really not difficult to land shots on these guys, and I get a lot more out of using my current combo. Anyways, back to the fight itself. This part of the fight is extremely easy. When both eyes are in their first phase, most of their attacks can be avoided simply by zigzagging across the arena, so avoiding damage isn't really an issue here. Instead, the main thing I'm focusing on currently is dealing as much damage as possible to Spasmatasm. Now, this is pretty standard in this fight, so I'm not going to get super in depth here, but basically, Phase 2 Retinizer is much harder than Phase 2 Spasmatasm, so I like getting the easy guy out of the way first. As a result of killing Spasmatasm first, this fight ends up being split into four stages. Stage 1 when both eyes are in their first phases, Stage 2 when Spasmatasm enters the second phase, Stage 3 when Spasmatasm dies, and Stage 4 when Retinizer enters the second phase. Now, obviously, I already mentioned that stage 1 is pretty easy, but where this fight really starts to get difficult is in stage 2. Once Spasmatasm enters the second phase, he suddenly gains a giant ass flamethrower, and instead of doing 10 little dashes, he now does 6 enormous charges. These 6 charges are incredibly fast, and typically they require some really agile mobility like a shield of Cthulhu in order to avoid. I have a web slinger. What's even worse is that because Spasmatasm immediately pulls out a flamethrower once the charges end, if I don't give myself enough space after the 6th charge, I'm going to get hit. This alone already makes this stage very difficult, but when you also consider that Ratanizer is still constantly shooting his annoying ass lasers and getting in the way of dodging Spasmatasm, yeah, this stage is hell. After about a minute of fighting, Spasmatasm caught me off guard with his flamethrower, and I was dead. Overall, this first fight was pretty sloppy. I was evading most of Spasmatasm's dashes, but I wasn't doing a great job spacing myself away from Retinizer's lasers, and I kept getting caught by the flamethrower. Still, I managed to get about 75% of the way through Spasmatasm's second phase, which wasn't bad for a first attempt. 
Of course, all I could do from here was keep trying, but one thing I did notice during the fight was that the top platform was getting in the way a bit, so I took a moment to remove it. Other than that, I crafted my buffs, waited out a random blood moon, and got back after for the next attempt. As you can expect, this first phase was once again not a problem. It really is as simple as just zigzagging across the arena for 2 minutes, and although I made a few more mistakes than last time, I was still heading into stage 2 with full health and 40 seconds left on my potion cooldown. Right off the bat in stage 2, you can see my strafing against Spasmatasm is way better. I did a much better job of bidding out the dashes, while not committing so much movement on my own. This allowed me to not only avoid the dashes easier, but also give myself ample space from the flamethrower after the 6th dash. As the fight continued to progress though, mistakes were starting to come out. I made a bad dodge to the third set of dashes, which forced me to take a hit from Spasmatasm and get beamed by a few lasers that otherwise could have been avoided. Luckily, my health potion had just come off cooldown, so this wasn't too big of a deal, but without a health potion for the rest of the stage, I needed to hold it together. The next set of dashes rolled around, and yet again, I messed up. I missed time my grapple, causing me to take another hit from Spasmatasm. By now, I was at half health with no potion in sight. Only a few seconds later, I messed up another grapple, and before I knew it, I was dead. This fight is so brutal, man. Even just a slight mistiming on a grapple caused me to lose half my health in less than a second. You can't make mistakes in this fight, you just die. Every single dash phase requires so much focus, and the constant lasers from Retinizer just chip your health down and don't even feel avoidable most of the time. I truly did feel like I did a better job at dodging the dashes than I did in the first fight, but my mistakes led me to get only about two thirds of the way through stage two, and the worst part is, the fight's not even over after this. I still have two more stages to get through, so if I don't have good enough health going into stage three, I'm going to die. Needless to say, I'm not making enough progress with these attempts. I'm gonna need a miracle to make this happen, and I just don't know if I can do it. So far, stage 2 was going incredibly well. My movement has been on point, and I've been manipulating Spasmatasm's dashes like no other. By moving in the small zigzag pattern, dodging Spasmatasm is made way more consistent, and Retinize's laces are much less likely to hit me. Even further, my damage here has been absolutely amazing, but I can't get too excited. I still have two more stages after this one. All I can do is just hold it together from here.
I did it. Against all odds, I had beaten the three mechanical bosses with chest loot only. And holy shit, this was probably the hardest fight I've ever done this entire game. Now, I think I've already explained enough about stages 1 and 2, but I do want to talk a bit about stages 3 and 4, and really the fight as a whole. Starting with stage 3, this is a similar story to how stage 1 is. I figured out that by baiting Retinizer down on his last dash and launching into the sky with the Web Slinger, I'm placed far enough away from Retinizer that he actually just doesn't shoot. This is also the first stage where I brought out the Flame Lash, as now that there's only one eye, its single target damage is pretty solid. Obviously though, no one expected Phase 1 Retinizer to be a challenge. Just like with Spasmatasm, where this fight really ramps up is when he enters Phase 2. Stage 4 of this fight is something else. The strategy here is very clear. When Retinizer is shooting normally, you run horizontally. When he's barraging, you fly vertically. But actually executing this is not nearly as easy as it seems. For one, after I fly up to avoid the barrage, I still need to get back down. This means that in order to avoid taking any damage, I need to fall at the perfect time so that I miss both the final laser of the barrage and the first laser of his regular attack. This is pretty easy when he's healthy, but as he starts to get lower, man, what the hell. That's not all though. When Retinizer is first entering his barrage, usually he moves away from you, allowing you to fly into the air. Sometimes though, he just cuts in front of you, guaranteeing a hit. Now, when he's healthy, I was able to avoid this inconsistency by hooking backwards just before the barrage, but as he starts to get lower, this once again becomes much harder to do. Believe it or not, this bad barrage was extremely close to ending the fight. After I messed up my web slinger launch and lost nearly half my health, Renizer immediately followed up with a bad barrage, and the fight had completely shifted from my favor. This put me in a situation where if I got another bad barrage, I was toast. Luckily though, I got the turnaround, and ended up killing Retinizer with just a sliver of health left. Overall, I enjoyed this fight a lot. I don't think there's ever been a time in this game where I've had to actually practice and develop a strategy for killing a boss, but all three of the mech bosses in this challenge required me to do so, and it was a fun mix-up. Obviously though, the run's not over yet. I still have to get past Plantera with the same lousy ass items I have now, after which I'll gain access to the 5 biome chest weapons and beat the game from there. So, if you guys want to see me get past Moon Lord using only the biome chest weapons, I highly encourage you to subscribe so you don't miss out, but as of now, I think this is a good spot to end the video. Seriously guys, thank you all so much for watching. This video has taken a lot of effort to make, but I had a lot of fun with this challenge and I hope you all enjoyed watching it. If you guys did enjoy watching this video, I'd highly recommend my wolf playthrough, which is a very similar style video to this one. Other than that, any sort of comment is greatly appreciated, and yeah, I'll see you all in the next one.